folks joining and uh, we'll get started here in just a second all right so james chapter 3 is where we're going to be so open your bibles there james 3 uh, i read esv on sunday morning i'll read csv uh, here now and um it's a little bit different but the same same words all right again y'all be sure to share this y'all are welcome to share there's some option there on your screen where you can just send it right over to your page and others can can jump on we can get some more folks uh, with us all right i'm gonna read james chapter 3 uh, verses 1 to 12. Again, I'm reading from the CSV Bible. James says this. Not many of you should be become teachers, my brothers, because you know that we will receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is mature, able to control the whole body. Now, if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we direct their whole bodies. And consider ships, though very large and driven by fierce winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So too, though the tongue is a small part of the body, it boasts great things. Consider how small a fire sets ablaze a large forest. And the tongue is a fire. The tongue, a world of unrighteousness, is placed among our members. It stains the whole body. It sets the course of life on fire, and it is itself on fire by hell. Every kind of animal, bird, reptile, and fish is tamed and has been tamed by humankind, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in God's likeness. Blessing and cursing come out of the same mouth. My brothers and sisters, these things should not be this way. Does a sweet spring pour out sweet and bitter water from the same opening? Can a fig tree produce olives, my brothers and sisters, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt water spring yield fresh water. Would you pray with me? Father, we are thankful to, to gather this way. And though we are not present with one another physically in the same room or able to look at each other eye to eye, online we, we gather. And in your providence, Lord, you knew this week or weeks would come or even months would come. We trust you with every day, every hour, every minute. Now we are grateful to open your word together, to join our hearts, uh, our time together as we look into your word. Would you speak to our hearts? Would you draw us near to you? As was mentioned at the beginning of this uh, live Facebook feed, we pray for those right now on the front lines, nurses and doctors and medical professionals and so many who are involved right now with the coronavirus. They truly are the front lines. We ask that you might give them strength, that you would protect them from being infected. For so many that have been infected, oh God, we ask that you would cease this virus, that you would stop it. We know your will is for good. We live in a fallen world, a broken world. We can't explain some of these things. It's, it's mind boggling for so many. None of us have experienced this. So we ask for your help. We trust that you are good even in the midst of this. So help us tonight. Help us draw near to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, it's good to see everybody here. Let's, uh, let's just jump in, okay? So uh, again, I'm on the back deck here, Athens, Georgia, in, uh, in my backyard. Beautiful uh, springtime, lots of pollen blowing through the air. So someone warned me not to sneeze or rub or itch my eyes. 
I'll do my best. All right, so if you've got a worksheet, again, I posted it in the comments below. Uh, and you can grab that and just kind of follow along with me. If you don't have it, I'm going to guide you through it as best I can. Ten questions that will help us review the sermon from Sunday. Again, you can use that as a resource to go back as I preach through James 3, 1 to 12. Let me bring everybody up to speed, though, just so you uh, can kind of think about this contextually. I believe that that's helpful. Sometimes we can grab these verses and we can use them as life verses or whatever, but it's really good to have uh, the context. Remember, I mean, James is kind of known as uh, one that's talking about trials and uh, working through those. James chapter one. Well, to me, that sets the whole lens on what James is talking about. He's speaking to the church, but he's speaking about trials and people that that endure trial. Well, think about what we're in right now. I mean, this is without a doubt a trial. So I, I want to try my best as a pastor just to be uh, to bring some application to this, too. So, again, keep in mind, James is talking about trials. He's given us two wonderful examples. Abraham, Father Abraham, gave us the example of, uh, oh goodness, <laughs> Rahab, there you go. And both are dramatically different. Abraham, father of the faith. Some might even kind of put him up there with Billy Graham as I talked about last week. Of course, that's tongue in cheek. Rahab called a prostitute, known as that, but Yet God did a redemptive work in our life. And James uses these two examples. And then he talks to us about uh, the tongue. So he shifts gears a little bit. And I believe that he talks about the tongue because the tongue, though it is so small, as James says, can do a world of hurt. And James wants us to walk in our faith. He wants us to really live out our faith. So let's look here at our questions, okay? They're, they're application questions. They help us really wrestle with the text. The first is this, recall a time when you've hurt someone with your words. What was motivating you? Well, this might cause you to reflect a little bit. Sometimes we can't immediately go there and think of a time that we have hurt someone with our words. But um, I had some time just to prepare today and I just begin to think about times that I've said foolish things to, to people or hurtful things to people. and in my heart, if I'm honest, I know that the reason why I did so, I, I may have been embarrassed by something they said to me or just insecure on my own. And so my anger caused me to then lash out and, and speak ill or ugly things towards them. And so the, the question here is saying, so what's motivating you? And I think some of that was uh, an evil motivation, maybe to look, make myself look better right? To put them down. So these, these questions are going to cause us just to look uh, reflectively at our own hearts and, and ask, why do we speak what we speak? Again, number one, recall a time when you've hurt someone with your words and what was motivating you. Uh, maybe, maybe chew on that the rest of this week as you uh, think through this text. Um, th this kind of sets up a little bit of my philosophy for ministry. I don't believe that Sunday is just one hour that we kind of just hear the text and we just move on. Again, that's what James warns us of. James says, don't be hearers of the word only, but be doers of the word. Uh, me as a pastor, I want to really lodge it into the heart of the people. So I want to preach it on Sunday and then here come on Wednesday and then reflect on it and apply it. And so that's what Wednesday is. If you're a part of Green Acres, uh, you know that on Wednesday, that's what I'm doing. Uh, preaching in many ways is, is an iceberg and on Sunday, you're just getting that tip. And on Wednesday, we try to just uncover and go a little bit deeper. So that's what these questions are designed for. I do want to give a shout out to exalting Jesus in James. That's the Christ-centered exposition uh, commentary. And I've used that. That's where these questions come from. So uh, I'm not stealing them, just using them as a tool and resource. Okay, everybody with me? Y'all give me a thumbs up. Let me know you're here following along. Uh, number two is this, uh, what's wrong with the idea that our actions and our words are what really matter? W what's wrong with that idea that our actions and our words are what really matter? That might sound a little confusing, but let's, let's just kind of dig into that. I believe that 
that's our uh, that's a wrong idea because what really matters is the heart so i want you to think about that I, I say this to my son quite a bit my son's 10 and i say ryan what matters most and what he says back to me is dad the heart matters most i believe when you look all throughout scripture jesus is preaching towards the heart he's not trying to make out of us a religious people a, a pharisaical people who are only concerned with the exterior so what's wrong with the idea number two what's wrong with the idea that our actions and our words are what really matter what's wrong with that idea is that it's the heart that matters most so you may remember on sunday again you can rewind and go back to that video from sunday but Jesus says these words, Jesus, this is Luke 6, 45. He says, for out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Jesus knows, our Lord and Savior, James, the half-brother of Jesus, knows that it's not words or actions that matter most. It's the heart that matters most. For when the heart is changed and transformed, so are the words and so are the actions. So James' whole mantra here has been, be people who live out our faith. Faith without works is dead. He wants faith and works to run together. He believes they do. He believes that you cannot be a person of faith and not show your faith. That they, they work together. These are one and of the same thing. So, what's wrong with that idea that our actions and our words are what really matter? What's wrong with that idea is that our heart matters most. It's not that our actions and words don't matter. They, they matter, but what matters most is our heart. And when our heart is changed, then too our words and our actions will be changed. All right, everybody with me? we got some more folks jumping in here. Hey, joining me in my backyard from my deck. It's a beautiful day here in Athens, Georgia. Sipping on some uh, chai tea. And like you, you may be in the house and we're making the best of this. Be praying for all those on the front lines for sure. Okay, number three. Number three is this. The God of the Bible is the God who speaks. How should that reality affect our view of words the god of the bible is the god who speaks how should that really the reality affect our view of words including our own you may remember from sunday morning i gave basically the theology that god speaks from the very beginning he created with words he spoke with with words I believe that that reality change, changes the way that we speak and the way that we view words because we understand that words are powerful. Now, I, I want to caution us here. We, we, we're not of the belief that you can speak things into being, okay? I, I point that out because there are a number of folks, even church movements, uh, I'll, I'll just name them the Word of Faith movements, who have taken this idea that you can just speak things into, into being, the name and claim it movement. And that's very dangerous. That's very dangerous to, to believe that, that you can say something and that, that it will happen. It, it, it puts you um, on the same level as God. And that's not what this is saying here. We have a belief and a doctrine that God spoke all things into being, that He's the Creator and that He's all-powerful. And what that does is it influences us and helps us understand that our words too matter. So how does that change or how does that give us a right view of our words? Well, I believe with that in mind, then we'll be careful about what we say because we know that our words carry weight and that our words can influence. Our words can persuade. Our words can be used for such good to, to teach and to encourage and to build up and to, to give life. Uh, so the God of the Bible being one who speaks and his words mattering, his words being powerful, shape the way that we think about our words. And we know that we'll be accountable to the words that we say. So words have power because God is a God who speaks. Number four. Explain why the potential for great damage is so great. Uh, 
right in the case of teachers. All right, so if you're just joining us, we're coming out of James chapter 3. And James chapter 3 talks about teachers, specifically uh, those in the church. And he gives a warning. He says, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, because you know that we will receive stricter judgment. This is not James discouraging teaching. He's just saying it comes with a great responsibility. As a matter of fact, I believe this encourages teaching. It encourages right teaching in the church. And it reminds us that we will be judged stricter, meaning there is a greater responsibility for those who teach the word of God. Uh, number four, explain why the potential for great damage is so great in the ca case of teachers. I want you to, to think with me about, and we'll go in, on the positive side of this. I want you to think about a teacher that made a, a really big difference in your life. All right. Or, or maybe it was a coach. Maybe you had someone in your life and they were incredibly impactful. Uh, maybe it was school or maybe it was out on the field. Um, maybe it was in... Hopefully we're good. So the question again, think about someone who's made a really big impact on your life. Nine times out of ten, whether it's a teacher, a coach, a pastor, that person spoke life-giving words uh, to you. Now... Uh, we're going to get here in a moment. You know, what matters in the life of a teacher? Well, um, character, integrity, and these things matched up to what they said. And that's what made the greatest impact. It's not as though they taught in such a way that just blew your mind, but you could match up what they taught and how they lived. Well, I believe that's what James is getting at, that we ought to live uh, with godly character and integrity, those who are teaching, especially in the church. Now, on the negative side, I want you to think of someone that may have said things to you that, that really just wounded and they hurt you. Um, someone that you really respected, and maybe it was not directly to you, but they were respected and they had a great responsibility, whether it be in the school or the church, and they just really let you down and they had a moral failing or whatever it might be. I mean, it's so sad sometimes to hear of pastors and them uh, slipping and falling into just disgrace. And what that does to their ministry, it affects uh, what people heard before. Uh, they, they begin to question their faith or maybe what that, that teacher said. So I believe this explains the potential for great damage in, in the case uh, for teachers. Here's an analogy. I've got a lot of trees behind me, okay? So imagine um, there's a really, really big tree out here, okay? Imagine that tree just all of a sudden fell. And believe it or not, we actually have had one of these trees just drop all of a sudden. All you hear is a big boom, right? So imagine this huge tree back here just dropped to the ground and Lord willing, it would fall that way, right? Away from the house. Let's say that large tree fell to the ground um, it would not be that tree alone that fell. Most of the time when a large tree falls, it takes a lot of smaller trees with it. And for us, I believe that that's an illustration just to think about the potential of great damage in the case of teachers. Many times teachers are viewed as, as large oak trees and they're men and women of integrity and they stand for for truth, even in the uh, academia world. And when they begin to uh, uh, sp speak in, in ways that are un ungodly or untruthful, it can really affect a lot of the smaller trees around it, so to speak. As that large tree falls, it takes out other trees. So number four, explain the potential for great damage and why it's so great in the case of teachers. I believe that that is a, uh, is a principle there okay N number five again uh, the worksheets are there in the comments below you can pull those up or you can just follow along here we're looking at james chapter 3 verses 1 to 12 some folks are just jumping in glad you're joining us um number five says this what are some of the characteristics we should look for in teachers of god's word 
What are some of the characteristics? Well, I, I looked this up today, just uh, what the Bible says about teachers. There are lots of different teachers. I just uh, re referenced uh, teachers in school, teachers on college campuses, coaches even, uh, obviously teachers in, in the church. Um, James uh, talks specifically about uh, the church, and that's the context. But I was also thinking about 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy lines out for us um, requirements or qualifications of overseers and deacons. And within the context of the church, it is the overseers that are the primary teachers. They're not the only ones that can teach, but they are the primary teachers of God's flock, the, the preachers and teachers of God's word. And I want you to listen to what it says here. Again, this is 1 Timothy 3. I'll read verses 1 to, to 7. And he, he says this, This saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to be an overseer, he desires a noble task. An overseer, therefore, must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, self-controlled, sensible, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not an excessive drinker, not a bully, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not greedy. He must manage his own household completely and have his children under control with all dignity. If anyone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of God's church? He must not be a new convert or he might become conceited and incur the same condemnation as the devil. Furthermore, he must have a good reputation among outsiders so that he does not fall into disgrace and the devil's trap. I believe that we can uh, take uh, a cue here from from 1 Timothy 3 on what are the qualifications uh, for a teacher. I think the bottom line is it's got to be a person of character and of integrity. I mean, here within the context of James, he's talking about uh, teaching God's word. He's talking about instructing and leading the flock. And there's a real danger in leading them in the wrong way. You may remember from Sunday, I talked about just being a tick to the right or a tick to the left. And while that might seem insignificant or small up front, over the long run, that can really lead people off track. We don't want to be that kind of teacher. We want to lead people in the right direction, in the ways of God. We want to be respectable in all we do, a person of character, a person of in integrity. It's not just the words that matter. Remember, it's the heart that matters most, and Jesus tells us that. So that answers number five. What are some of the characteristics we should look for in the teachers of God's word? I do want to read another text for you. This is Romans chapter three, because here would be the opposite. We have read what are the qualifications of an overseer, uh, what we might think of, of, of a teacher of character and of integrity. But listen to the words of Romans three as Paul outlines the opposite. He says this of the opposite. That would be the false teachers. That would be those that lead people astray. Romans 3.13, their throat is an open grave. They deceive with their tongues. Vipers, venom is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. We don't want to be those kind of folks. Their mouth an open grave. No, let us be men and women of God who instruct the, the people of God in the ways of God, who live lives of integrity and lives of character. Again, the heart matters most. Number six, what do our words tell us about our hearts? What do our words tell us about our hearts? Well, I'll leave that for you to figure out. I've not uh, heard everything that you've said. But I know when I speak ill, when uh, my mouth is out of line, that's the question I ought to ask. Lord, why did I say that? Why did I react in that manner? Why did I lash out? Lord, show me my heart. I, I spoke about this on Sunday. I, that, that, that's a prayer. We're, we're, we're literally praying, Holy Spirit, convict me of my sin. Continue to sanctify me and show me my, my heart. Think about the scripture. This is Jeremiah 17, 9. Jeremiah 17, 9 says that the heart is deceitfully, uh, or I'm sorry, the, the heart is deceitful above all things and is desperately wicked. Who can know it? 
when you're honest, you realize not just looking on a surface level, but going much deeper, you realize, yes, my heart is desperately wicked and it can only be transformed by Jesus, only changed by uh, the loving mercies of Christ. Proverbs 20 verse 5 says, the purposes of a man's heart are deep waters, but one who has insight draws them out. That, that's the people we want to be. We want to be people who are reflecting deeply on God's word, who are not just moving on a surface level, actions and words only. We're saying, Lord, show me my heart. I want my heart to be pleasing to you. Um, number six, what do our words tell us about our hearts? I believe that that's what they might tell us. And why is the tongue so difficult to control? Well, I believe just as James says, the tongue's difficult to control because no one has ever tamed the tongue. And the only one who can tame the tongue is the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we come into submission to him every day, this is not just a one time thing where you walk an aisle and everything's fixed and fine. No, I believe we walk on a regular basis, coming before the Lord Jesus, submitting our hearts to him. And so the tongue is so difficult to control, but the Lord Jesus in his power is able to do a transforming work in us. The Holy Spirit gives us self-control that we might walk in him and our, trunk, our tongues might be controlled. All right, everybody still with me? Number seven here. Number seven, how would you counsel another believer whose uh, conversation is often impure? Well, that's a difficult conversation. Again, the context here is a believer. A believer whose conversation is often impure. Um, I'd say this. I'd say uh, you got to have a relationship with them. I don't know that you move so easily into those conversations with people and just begin to uh, point it out. Now, maybe you're the prophet type and you believe you just need to show up and tell them what's true. But I also believe in being gracious. And so having a relationship with them, and maybe it is a friend and you're saying, hey, dear brother or sister, could, could we meet for coffee? Could we, could we talk? And uh, I, I, here's where I'd start. I'd start with God's word and I'd begin to show them what God's word says about the tongue because we, we don't want to become the Holy Spirit. We want the Holy Spirit to do the convicting. We want the Holy Spirit to begin to, to speak to their heart. So I might come to them with like uh, Proverbs. I found myself in the Proverbs all day today talk, thinking about the tongue. Proverbs 15, 1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Proverbs 10, 11, the mouth of, a, of the righteous is a fountain of life. But the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. So again, I would want to direct a friend, a brother, a sister, and what the scripture would say about, about the tongue. Um, Proverbs 16, 24. Gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Gracious words are like a honeycomb. They are sweet to to the soul and healing to the bones. This is how we would want to counsel someone who uh, we believe is a, is a Christian, but often their speech seems to be impure. They may say things that are uh, hurtful or um, things that are, are gossiping. I, I don't know what the scenario might be, but how we would go to them. And then as I think about this, uh, Proverbs sixteen twenty four, I also think about uh, Psalm nineteen ten. Listen to this. God's word to us, they are more precious than gold, more precious than pure gold, sweeter than honey. Now, why do I bring this up? Because remember, we've got to start with a theology that begins with God. God is the one that speaks. So how might our words be? Well, may they be modeled after God. May they be honoring to him. God is holy. He's mighty and strong. I, I think about Isaiah. Remember Isaiah chapter 8? where um, he comes before the Lord and there he says, uh, God, I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. I mean, there he encounters a holy God and he's changed. So it's not as though we're, 
beating someone up with the Bible or we're just kind of giving them some robotic uh, tips on how to maybe change their tongue, but we're directing them towards the Lord. We're directing them towards Jesus and, and praying uh, for them that the Lord might convict their heart. And we're directing them towards God's words. I mean, when God's words become precious to you, of much more pure gold, sweeter than honey. And each day we're going into God's word, that has an effect on us. The Holy Spirit begins to convict and show us deep crevices of our heart and why we've spoken in such a way. And Lord willing, there will be transformation. That's how I would counsel someone who often is impure with their speech, though they may be a believer. They, they need a brother or sister to, to come alongside them and help them see that. I believe that that is one of the roles of the church. Okay, number eight. We've got a couple more to go. Number eight is this. What are two or three practical ways you can be more careful with your words? Well, if we were uh, really live in person, I'd ask you. I'd say, you, you tell me. Now, you could comment here if you want. Uh, but we'll just go with it. What, what are two or three practical ways that you can be more careful with your words? I jotted a couple down, just, you know, again, me reflecting on this. And I just thought, you know, um, that we uh, think before we speak. I, again, this is practical. Think before you speak. Uh, that goes for married couples too, right? So, so there you are with your wife or your spouse, think before you speak. How about this? Pray about it. I often find myself, I'm a, I'm a talker, rushing into things uh, and just, uh, uh, I, I, I refer to myself as an external processor, right? Yeah, it's just an excuse, uh, but talking out loud. And I've been convicted often that I ought to go to the Lord first before I begin to just speak. Not necessarily that I might be an error, but that I've not gone to God first. And that's what we ought to be doing. Um, how about in the heat of the moment? I mean, simple, practical things of just holding your tongue. There's so many things I've said in the heat of the moment that were hurtful and they were wrong. I mean, the, the greatest application here, I think, is just with my own spouse, Melanie. We have gotten in a spat about something and it is in the heat of the moment. And I say something that I should not have said. And so, yes, obviously go to her afterwards and console her and tell her that I'm sorry and I'm sinful and I need her to forgive me. Um, but just in, in the heat of the moment, uh, take a break. Um, maybe you need to, to just step outside for a little bit. Now, that does not mean run from the problem, <laughs> uh, but maybe you just need to cool off and... Uh, and step outside just for a bit, take a break, think before you speak, pray about it. All right. Hey, y'all, thanks for joining me live. I'm encouraged. I hope you are too. We're doing our best with this, right? Okay, number nine. How do James's instructions apply to social media? Text, emails, internet communication, etc. Well, here we are on Facebook Live, so this is very uh, contextual even, this question. Well, gosh, I mean, I think it's the exact same way. Uh, I think it just becomes a little easier to say things that we should not say because we're hiding behind screens. And we've all heard the case for that. It's easy to text something, email something, hop on Instagram or Twitter and just put things on there we should not uh, say or type. So uh, I think we use the same, the same wisdom here. And we ask for the Holy Spirit uh, to, to lead us in that. I mean... I'm praying the Holy Spirit would convict many people that have hopped online, even even believers, and said things that they had they should have not have said. And um, I, I've even seen some reconciliation where they have, in the same thread, apologized and said, "Hey, look, I'm sorry. I, I I saw that you had to delete my comment there. Thank you for doing that. You did the right thing." As I thought about it, man, I got home. My wife jumped my case. Sometimes sometimes your wife is like the the Holy Spirit. <laughs> um, but I'm praying just as we are definitely in an internet age that people would apply the same principle. James is not um, talking about only written uh, or preached or, or taught word. It, it is words, our words, and how they can be a world of hurt. And we ought to be uh, cautious with them. 
All right. Uh, cool, cool. Good to see y'all. Um, last question here. What should we expect from unbelievers in terms of their words? Explain your answer. What should you expect from unbelievers in terms of their words? Well, uh, God's common grace is to all. So just because a person is an unbeliever doesn't mean that they don't have valuable words. A lot has been done and even said uh, by those who are unbelievers. But I believe we've got to keep in mind here that these are unredeemed. These are people who have not experienced the transforming power of Jesus. And so many of their words are in vain. And they may not be under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit or when they are spoken out of turn and, and ugly, they, uh, they don't have a Holy Spirit to convict them and to draw them uh, to what is right. So what, sh what should we expect of unbelievers in terms of their words? Well, I think you expect that they are unbelievers. They're not, they're not believers. They're not under the impression of God's Spirit, and they've not had a true encounter with Jesus, which would transform the heart and transform the words. But I believe this ought to be a way that we um, can redemptively speak to unbelievers. Uh, it could be that their own words convict them of their sin. It could be the things that they have said help them realize, man, they need Jesus. They, they don't know why they continue to just pour out just gross speech. You know, I, I talked on Sunday about the, the man cussing like a sailor. But the moment that he encountered Jesus, the moment that he got saved, he was radically changed. And it's almost as though his mouth came under divine um, inspiration. And that's what we would hope for any unbeliever, that they might trust in Christ and be truly transformed. All right. Well, hey, that's it for tonight. Don't hop off just yet. I want to pray for all of you and uh, pray for all that's going on in the world right now. Okay, it's been great to be here with you. Again, I hope you're encouraged. Um, you can go back and read James 3, 1 to 12. Um, work through this worksheet. Uh, we'll be moving this week into the rest of 3 and even uh, chapter 4. And um, for those at Green Acres, this is just where we're at. And I'm trying to keep us steady. And sometimes it's good just to kind of stay in regular practice with all that you're doing, okay? All right, I'm just looking at you guys. Great to see you. Everybody's still in here. Okay. All right. Well, hey, would you join me in prayer wherever you're at, whether uh, you're on the couch or even in your car, maybe you could pull over for a sec. Uh, or just at home, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer and um, ask for his help. Father, we thank you for our time together tonight. Thank you for your word and um, how it speaks to all of life. And um, we ask for your help. We ask for your help that we might be people who honor you with our lives, who live lives worthy of the gospel, and that even means uh, the words that we say. I pray that you would bring our tongues under uh, submission to you. That really it is about our hearts, that our hearts would be fully submitted to you, Lord Jesus. That we, we would be people who say yes to you. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would convict us when we speak ill, when we speak hurtful words. That we might even be open to our brother or sister as they would come to us. Uh, able to admit where we have um, uh, spoken wrong. Lord, we need your help. The tongue is not easily tamed, but it is um, conquered through the power of Jesus. And, and we just need your leadership in our life. Father, right now we come and we just pray for all that's going on in the world, um, much internationally, sure. But even in our own nation with this coronavirus, we pray for many who are ailing. We pray uh, just as we did at the beginning for those on the front lines, doctors and nurses and medical professionals. God, give them strength and help. Long hours. 
Lord, we pray for those infected by the coronavirus, for your healing hand on them. Lord, would you bring about a cessation of this virus? Would you bring about healing? And God, would you do your will? We, we ask for that most, Lord. We, we trust in your sovereign plan that you allowed this. You knew it. We don't understand it all, but Lord, we, we trust you. You're good. And we ask that you um, would just help our hearts, help us as we uh, just wrestle with our own flesh, our own frailty in this moment. Help us not to waste um, these weeks, these months, but to draw near to you. I, I pray for that, Lord. Help, help your church, strengthen your church, strengthen your people. God, we thank you for your mercies and your grace to us. Um, we are nothing without you. And God, we just thank you and praise you for, for life, breath, and our being. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, y'all, thanks so much for joining. Those that are just joining a little late, that's totally fine. You'll be able to take uh, the video and just kind of scroll back with your finger and catch the beginning and watch it all the way through. And I hope that you'll do so. You can share this even afterwards and you can do so with your friends. Hey, if you're watching tonight and you've just jumped on and you are just curious about all this Bible stuff and I mean, God's working in your heart and through this coronavirus, there's been fear, anxiety, just like everyone else, but maybe you're wrestling with like, is God real? And is this whole Jesus thing real? I just want to be able to say to you, yes, yes. There is no other hope other than the hope that is found in Christ. And uh, fear, anxiety, yes, but yeah, uh, even for um, for Christians, but but look, I'm I'm telling you, there's a deeper hope that is found in Christ, and I want to encourage you. If that's you, and you're saying, I don't know if I'm really a Christian. Look, the Bible is plain and simple. The Bible says that if whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And there's no like magical prayer or anything. You just say to God, God, I need you. I repent of my sin. I I realize even through this Bible study of words, I realize that. Uh, my words are, are wicked. I, I, I say all sorts of things I shouldn't say. And I repent of my sin and I trust in Jesus right now. I mean, you don't have to be in a church to, to, to follow Jesus. Y you in your home right now say, Lord Jesus, would you save me? I am a sinner and I am in need of you. It is as simple as that, my friends. And I Pray that you would follow Jesus in these times, difficult times, difficult for everybody. But I couldn't imagine not having hope in Christ and really being a follower of Jesus. And I would just extend that to you. Would you follow Christ? Would you say yes to him? Would you call in the name of the Lord that you might be saved? Well, hey, y'all, it's been good to be with you again. Cameron Ford from my backyard or my back porch in Athens, Georgia. It's a beautiful spring day. I'm looking forward to getting out soon and being with you uh, soon, soon, soon and very soon, Lord willing, until Jesus comes back. All right. Many blessings, many blessings. Bye y'all. Y'all have a great night. Thank you so much.